Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's um, edition of Ethics Grand Rounds. My name is Deborah DeBruin, and I direct the Center for Bioethics here at the University of Minnesota. Um, this is the second of our two-part series representing perspectives both for and against legislation that would permit what some would call medical aid in dying and others call physician-assisted suicide. We at the Center for Bioethics are hosting this series to help inform public discussion about such a bill currently under consideration at the Minnesota legislature. We decided to host these two events rather than a one-time debate to allow for more opportunity to explore the complexity of issues and the diversity of perspectives. The first event was held on Friday, January 28th. The recording is available on our website in case you were unable to join us live for that event. You can still um, uh, take a look at it. The plan for today is to hear from all of our speakers and then to engage in what I'm sure will be a rich and interesting discussion. While we will not address questions until after all the speakers have presented, you should feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A feature, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. If you have technical issues, please let us know in the chat and center staff will address those issues as quickly as possible. We're reserving the use of the chat feature for addressing those technical issues. Before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to thank our events coordinator, Kayleen Jacobson, for all of her hard work um, in, in helping to organize this series of panel discussions. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors, the medical school, the law school, the School of Public Health, and the School of Nursing. Without further ado then, let me introduce today's speakers. We have a, a stellar lineup and we're fortunate indeed that they have all agreed to be here with us today. In the interest of time, I'm gonna keep these introductions very brief. We'll put links to their full bios in the chat. We'll begin with Dr. T. Brian Callister, who is professor of medicine and director of rural medical student education at the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine. Next will be Mr. John Kelly, who is director of Second Thoughts Massachusetts, an organization of disability rights advocates against assisted suicide. Mr. Kelly is also New England regional director for the National Disability Rights Organization, Not Dead Yet. Ms. Anita Cameron is director of minority outreach for the organization, Not Dead Yet. Dr. Daniel Salmezi is Andre Helliger's professor of biomedical ethics and director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University. And finally, we'll be joined by Minnesota State Senator John Hoffman, who represents residents of Minnesota Senate District 36, which includes the city of Champlin, parts of Brooklyn Park, and Coon Rapids. I'd like to offer all of our speakers my warm welcome and my gratitude for their time and for sharing their experience and expertise. At this time, Dr. Callister, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Deborah. It's a delight to be here with all of you. And you know, I'd like to start, I'm a clinician. I work in the hospital with medical students and residents. I've had the privilege of accompanying thousands of people on their journey through the end of life. And I wanna comment first on why I'm even here. Uh, initial issues came out with this legislation early on, uh, over 20 years ago now in Oregon, wasn't something I paid much attention to until something happened to me personally. I had two cases here in Nevada, about a month apart, with a resident on the wards, who each, in each case, the patients had treatable diseases with treatment they were not going to be terminal. They had a 50 to 70% chance of cure with treatment. I arranged for one patient to be transferred to Oregon and one to California where they lived, which is not something we typically do. 
but they wanted to get their definitive treatments close to home. In each case, when I was asked to have a peer-to-peer -peer with a medical director of the respective insurance companies, they stated that on the phone, they weren't gonna cover the transfer or the definitive therapy. And these were not experimental therapies, very standard. But as an aside, they said, hey, by the way, have you talked to them about assisted suicide, medical aid in dying? I, I was absolutely stunned. I didn't know what to say. And in each case, all I did end up saying was, well, it's not legal here. It's well, if you get them back to our state, you know, we can offer that. Now, something to keep in mind, I've been asked by a lot of people, why didn't you turn them in? That's illegal. They broke the law. No, they didn't break the law. What they did was perfectly legal because medical aid and dying in this legislation is billed as a medical therapy no different than any other medical therapies. And insurance companies will tell you, they claim there's no cause and effect in these decisions. In other words, denying definitive treatment, but approving the assisted suicide pills, unrelated according to them. So in that sense, no, there's nobody to turn them into. Everything they did was within the law. I got into this issue because of those two cases. And since then, it's become crystal clear to me why it's such a problem. I didn't ask for life ending. Treatment. I asked for life saving. Treatment. And yet the assisted suicide pills were readily offered. What we have to keep in mind is this does not expand choice. It contracts your choice. It limits your options when you're seeking medical treatment. It's not about freedom and autonomy. It's the opposite. Because other people, even if you're four, you want assisted suicide pills for yourself. This legislation creates an incentive for insurance companies to do the cheapest thing. And the cheapest option is not to treat you. The cheapest option is to give you some pills. And that's, that's not very costly. We've seen case after case of this around the country. The group that pushes, one of the groups that pushes this legislation uh, compassion. They will tell you that there hasn't been any adverse events around the country. Nothing could be further from the truth. They will also say that any of these reports you hear have been quote unquote debunked. They haven't been debunked at all. In fact, in my case, my senior resident who was with me at the time uh, went public and that was published in the Washington Free Beacon on June 5th, 2017, um, that you can look that up. Bill McMorris wrote the article. Now, you also have to know that there's individual people who have had terrible experiences. You take Jeanette Hall in Oregon, who wanted the assisted suicide pills. Not long after the bill was passed, her physician talked her into treatment. And what happened? 17 years, 18 years later, she's still around. Or Stephanie Packer in Southern California, who has an ongoing life-threatening pulmonary disease, and her pills were very, very expensive, very expensive. And what happened with Stephanie Packer, she had her pills denied in one letter, and then another letter said she could get the assisted suicide pills for $1.20 copay. That's the kind of thing that's been going around with this legislation. Keep in mind, too, that the problem with these laws and supposed safeguards is the folks that are for this come right around and try to expand the law. I witnessed the head of Compassion and Choices in the same week testifying on the East Coast about the safeguards of the timelines, the waiting periods and all those things. In the very same week, she was testifying on the West Coast to expand the assisted suicide law that was already in place to get rid of the timelines. And if you don't think this isn't big business, think again. Lonnie Shavelson in California opened up what I will call a death clinic. For $200, you could have a consultation with him. And if you wanted the pills, then it was another $1,800. His clinic has since been uh, closed down or he shut it down. The other issue that comes with that are there's not, in, not only legislation, but there's court cases now challenging the time limits so you could get the assisted suicide pills right away. Another thing to keep in mind, all of these talk about six months or less to live. That's not 
that's not a safeguard at all. Physicians are pretty good at giving you a diagnosis. We are not very good at predicting how long you are going to live. What do I mean by that? Hospice, six months or less. Assisted suicide legislation says, in my opinion, you have six months or less. 20% of hospice patients go off of hospice after six months because they outlive their diagnosis. In some states, that's much higher. In Mississippi, it was as high as 43%. So we're not very good at knowing how long you have. But more importantly, we're really bad at knowing how much quality time you might have. What do I mean by that? I give you a terminal diagnosis, but you're feeling pretty good. You might go three months or six months or a year, and then your last week or two, you're having some, a lot of symptoms and problems. We have the capacity through palliative care and hospice to treat your symptoms. And if you have those suicide pills, it's like having a loaded gun in your nightstand. You have a dark and despondent night, feeling like you're a burden to family, and those pills are there. How much good quality lifetime did you eliminate by taking those pills early? And the guilt that goes with that can be phenomenal. It also creates a perverse incentive. There's no witnesses required for the time of the pill administration or the death. What's to keep a family member who stands to inherit your house from telling granny, oh, granny, your arthritis is so bad. You don't want to live like this. Let's go get the suicide pills. And in fact, if you look at 20 years of Oregon data, it's clear that pain or even a future concern about pain is only listed by 20 to 25% of the people who requested the pills. What are the top reasons for requesting the suicide pills? Because it's not pain. The top reasons are loss of enjoyment and usual activities, loss of autonomy, being a burden to family. Over 80% of people list those things. Those are terrible social problems that we need to address. But last time I checked, they probably weren't good reasons to kill yourself. It really is disheartening. The other thing that comes up with this when we think about the effect these laws have on the consciousness of our society is the suicide contagion. Now, compassionate <laughs> dignity groups that push these laws will tell you there's no correlation here because suicide rates went up all over the country. Well, that's a little disingenuous. In Oregon, since the law was passed, the general suicide rate in the United States went up by 28%. In Oregon, it went up by 49%. Now, those are other suicides, not even the legal assisted suicides, because they don't count those. If someone takes these pills, we are required by law to write on the death certificate whatever other disease they may have had. We're not allowed to write suicide. So the vital statistics are wrong, too. And I've often posed the question, is this also an issue of Medicare fraud? Because we're falsifying death certificates. Something that I think is really concerning when we look at the total suicide rate, because it's not captured in that. Finally, you have to think about, as I mentioned earlier, the effect on other people. People that want full treatment and maybe offer the suicide pills instead because it's a cheaper option. And think about that grandmother with the house that's feeling like a burden to her family. So I'll close with this question. When does your right to die become somebody else's duty to die? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Callister. Um, Mr. Kelly? Okay, I'm just waiting for my video. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is John Kelly. I'll be offering the disability rights perspective. Next, please. Not Dead Yet's Origin and Issues. Not Dead Yet is the leading national disability rights group opposed to assisted suicide laws, futility judgments, 
mercy killing, and better dead than disabled messages as forms of deadly disability discrimination. We were founded in 1996 in the context of two Jack Kevorkian acquittals and a couple of Supreme Court cases. Later, it came out in the New England Journal of Medicine that two thirds of Kevorkian's victims were not terminal, but people, mostly women, with disabilities under terrible stress. Nonetheless, the media then and now continues to talk about his victims as terminally ill. Next, please. My story is that when I was 13 in 1971, a good friend of mine had a spinal cord injury and we all just assumed that his life would not be uh, what it was. And I, as his friend, felt so proud of myself, like I was some outreach worker. And my father even encouraged me to write about this experience to show my good character on my college application. But when I got injured in 1984, uh, there was also a disability civil rights movement going on and I got swept up in that. My big motivation to get involved with this work were the so-called give me liberty or give me death cases like Larry McAfee, a young man from Georgia whose neck was broken in a motorcycle accident, but Georgia did not have home care for disabled people. So the state contracted with out-of-state nursing homes to store him like a sack of potatoes in Alabama and Tennessee nursing homes. He became despondent, understandably. He sought uh, to die and they rigged up a switch that he would be able to activate. And the judge ruled that Larry would die of underlying quadriplegia, not suicide. That certainly sounds familiar, but uh, disability advocates learned about his case, met with him, changed his mind. He moved into the community and enjoyed the rest of his life. So what we find is it's not the disability that is the question, it's oppression. Next, please. Major US national disability groups opposed to assisted suicide. That includes ADAPT, American Association of People with Disabilities, um, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, the National Council on Disability, which issued its landmark uh, volume, The Danger of Assisted Suicide Laws in 2019. Next, please. There's a better dead than disabled mindset. My level of disability is often described as paralyzed from the neck down, which some people associate with a living death. Popular culture romanticizes the death of people like me. From films like Whose Life Is It Anyway, Million Dollar Baby, and the 2016 hit Me Before You, people are taught that lives like mine are a humiliating burden calling out for death. The, these uh, takes in uh, popular culture and society is oriented towards cure the disability or kill it. We confront discrimination everywhere, especially in medicine. In a survey of 714 practicing US doctors nationwide, over 80% reported that people with significant disability have worse quality of life than non-disabled people. These findings about physicians' perceptions of this population raise questions about ensuring equitable care to people with disability. Potentially biased views among physicians could contribute to persistent healthcare disparities affecting people with disability. Next, please. Assisted suicide is all about disability. People with terminal conditions are or will soon become disabled 
and form a subset of the vast disability population. As bioethicist Thaddeus Pope said to me in a 2020 debate, everybody who's using medical aid in dying is disabled. And probably you could go to the next step and say, the reason they want medical aid in dying is because of their disability. Next, please. Proponents talk about excruciating pain, but it's a bait and switch. Oregon bill writer Barbara Coombs Lee has spoken of disability scenarios people consider worse than death such as emotional distress over incontinence, quote unquote, more painful than any of the pain from the cancer. Palliative care expert, Dr. Ira Bayak, quote, it's a bait and switch. We're actually helping people hasten their deaths because of existential suffering. That's chilling to me. Almost all pain is controllable, he said. And the proponent group, um, tends to be wealthier, uh, with more education, and takes a dim view of life with a disability. As proponent Dan Diaz said, if he found himself dependent on others for toileting and position, quote, I would then submit, is that really living? Other countries, including Canada, euthanize disabled people who are not terminal. Next, please. As Dr. Callister said, the top end of life concerns um, do not deal with pain, but they're related to disability. We've got loss of autonomy, 90%. Participating in activities, 90%. A loss of dignity, 74%. And feeling like a burden at 48% incontinence at 43%. These aren't medical issues. These are existential personal issues. Next, please. It's also all about race, class, and ethnicity. Assisted suicide participants are overwhelmingly white. In California, 94% of reported assisted suicides have been by non-Hispanic whites twice the group's share of the state population. In the 2012 referendum in Massachusetts, less wealthy cities and towns with more Latino and black populations voted against assisted suicide. Wealthier cities and towns with more education voted yes. And working class white towns in Massachusetts also voted heavily against uh, the referendum. Next, please. Cost cutting was covered by Dr. Callister. Just to point out that in Oregon, you can qualify as terminal if you can't afford your own treatment or if treatment stops for any reason. Next, please. Elder and disability abuse, one in 10 elders. Under assisted suicide laws, an heir or abusive caregiver can encourage the person to request the lethal drugs, sign the forms as witness, pick up the lethal drugs, and even administer the drug with or without consent because no independent witness is required at the death. So who would know? There's the example of Thomas Middleton, who moved into crooked real estate broker's house, died by PAS, sold, uh, who then sold his house and put some of the proceeds in her own account. Oregon didn't notice. The feds put her in prison for real estate fraud. Next, please. Trust kills. Non-terminal people die. Dr. Callister covered this. I'll move on to the next. Next slide, mistaken prognosis, Jeanette Hall, Dr. Uh, Callister also covered that. She, oh, I'll go back, I'm sorry. I just wanna quote something. She wrote, 
I didn't want to suffer. I wanted to do what our law allowed. And I wanted my doctor to help me. Instead, he encouraged me not to give up. And ultimately, I decided to fight the disease. I had both chemotherapy and radiation. I am so happy to be alive. It is now 11 years later. It is now 20 years later. And there's a photograph of her and her doctor. Next, please. Violations go unpunished. Wendy Melcher. Trans woman Wendy Melcher was terminally ill, but had not taken the steps required to be provided assisted suicide. Her hospice nurse and another nurse, one of whom was allegedly having an affair with Wendy's partner, caused her death with massive doses of morphine. They were not referred to authorities for prosecution. The Oregon Nursing Board secretly gave them light discipline and they returned to nursing. Wendy's family didn't learn how she died until a reporter's call years later. The Portland Tribune editorialized, quote, if nurses or anyone else are willing to go outside the law, then all the protections built into the Death with Dignity Act are for naught. Next, please. Summary, under assisted suicide, some people will lose their lives through insurance denials, persuasion, coercion, and abuse, misdiagnosis, and unequal access to medical treatments. No safeguards have ever been enacted or even proposed that can prevent this outcome, which can never be undone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Next up, we have Ms. Anita Cameron. Thank you. So I was involved in the fight against Dr. Assisted Suicide for some time, but it didn't truly hit home for me until my mom got sick. My mother, while living in Washington State, was determined to be at the end stage of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I was told her death was imminent and that if I wanted to see her alive, I should get there in two days. She rallied, but was still quite ill, so she was placed in hospice. Her doctor said that her body had begun the process of dying. Though she survived six months of hospice, her doctor convinced her that her body was still in the process of dying and she moved home to Colorado to die. My mom didn't die. She became active in her community and lived almost 12 years. She passed away last February 1st. What was especially frightening was when I got the call, Washington State had just enacted its assisted suicide law. Had I told my mom that she could give up, that she was so tired, she would have asked for the sister suicide drugs because she loved and trusted me implicitly. And the doctor would have given her the drugs because she was deemed terminal. Proponents say that these laws are for terminally ill patients, but they must make mistakes as you see from my mom's story. So 2013 Pew Research Center study shows that Blacks and Latino people are 65% opposed to doctor-assisted suicide. And although assisted suicide requests in Oregon, which this bill and other bills are modeled on, are lower among Blacks and people of color, it doesn't mean that this won't change in most more diverse areas, especially as healthcare face faces cuts and assisted suicide becomes more acceptable due to the well-funded efforts of groups like Compassionate Choices. To racial disparities. So due to racial disparities in our healthcare system, Blacks are the sickest patients waiting for organ transplants, dead often die waiting. Blacks are diagnosed with cancer at much later stages and the prognosis is worse. Blacks get inferior diabetes care with more amputations. COVID-19 has killed Black, Indigenous, and people of color at higher rates than whites. Medical racism. So in a recent study of a million children with appendicitis in emergency rooms around the nation, Black children were one-fifth as likely to receive opioid pain killers for their severe pain as white children. 
In a 2016 study, a third of 222 white medical students and residents surveyed held the false belief that Blacks had a higher tolerance for pain and thicker skins like animals. Due to the stereotype of Black patients' noncompliance with doctors' instructions, Blacks were not given the state-of-the-art care white patients receive, especially when they have the money. So how do racial disparities in healthcare relate to assisted suicide? So Blacks are at risk of assisted suicide loss because racial disparities in health care lead to limited health choices and poor health outcomes, makes it more likely that doctors will write off patients as terminal, makes it less likely that patients can afford life-saving treatment, and makes it less likely that patients will receive adequate pain treatment. Um, and as someone who I have multiple disabilities and I live in pain, horrible pain, every waking minute of my life, I still do not want assisted suicide. So we have a specific story on racial disparities and disability disparities. Uh, Michael Hickson, he was a 46-year-old Morehouse grad. Uh, he had wife, uh, Melissa, and five teenage children. In 2016, he had a heart attack and um, uh, lost oxygen to his brain, and that led to him becoming a quadriplegic. Uh, he contracted COVID-19, uh, and, uh, and he was transferred to the hospital on June the 20th, uh, June 3rd, 2020. And Melissa had lost guardianship of Michael because she had insisted that he needed a specialized rehab facility rather than a nursing home. And so custody was given to an outside agency. On June the 5th, the doctor told Melissa that the hospital and state had decided that Michael would not get treatments. And he would not get treatments specifically because um, of, of his quadriplegia, because he was disabled. He couldn't walk and talk. And so the doctor deemed that he had no quality of life. The hospital had lowered Melissa's calls and told her seven days later that he had died the previous night on June 11. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cameron. Dr. Salmazi, I think you're up next. Great, thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can see my slides. Um, I'm taking my uh, cue from the title of the uh, entire session that physician-assisted suicide is bad medicine, uh, bad ethics, and bad law. Um, I think we would all agree um, on at least some uh, premises about the care of people at the end of life, um, that we should be compassionate toward them, uh, that we should improve access and the quality of the palliative care that we give them, and all of us here would agree uh, that when treatments become burdensome and they are unwanted by patients, that they um, uh, certainly can forego those kinds of life-sustaining treatments. But assisted suicide adds something very different and complex to the picture. Um, as I said in the title, it's bad medicine, bad ethics, and bad law. And if it weren't for those things, I'd be all for it. Why is it bad medicine? Well, first of all, it shouldn't be necessary for symptoms. Um, and again, some of the speakers have already pointed out how you may be getting snookered into thinking that you need this because it's the only way that your pain or other symptoms can be controlled. And that's simply false. Um, we can do more for symptoms than has ever been possible in the history of medicine. Palliative care is now a specialty. We can even give you pain control uh, to the point of sedation if you need it um, through something called the rule of double effect. And if you're not getting quality care at the end of life, ask your legislators to improve quality of and access to palliative care. Don't ask them to let you commit suicide. That doesn't seem very bright. If physician-assisted suicide, as Dr. Callister pointed out, um, is performed for something other than symptoms, like being a burden on others or um, existential angst, um, I would suggest that's medicine going awry. That's 
um, something that's beyond the scope of medicine. The function of medicine is not to relieve the human condition of the human condition. And if you are feeling hopeless, we don't look up in our um, indications books of pharmacology that um, giving people an overdose of uh, cecobarbital is the solution for that. What we need is more humble medicine and not more medical hubris. The third reason assisted suicide is bad medicine is that it disrupts the absolute trust that a patient has to have in order to have good care. Um, I'm convinced that this in the end is the core of the Hippocratic Oath. That in order to make yourself naked before a doctor, um, to tell them things you wouldn't tell anybody else, you have to believe that you can trust them. Um, and there are at least three things that we have to be able to guarantee to our patients. Um, I will not use you for sex. I will not disclose your secrets and I will not kill you. And if a patient can't at least depend on those three things being true, how can they trust their doctors? Physician assisted suicide is also bad ethics. There is more to ethics than simply patient autonomy. Um, even you'll say, well, it's not just autonomy that justifies this. Um, it's the duty of physicians to be merciful um, and to um, relieve patients who say they have unbearable suffering. But in fact, unbearable suffering is totally subjective and totally based on autonomy. If someone says to me um, that their suffering is unbearable, how am I to question that? So in fact, um, if that's the basis for assisted suicide, then the only basis for it is someone saying that they want to, uh, uh, to die. Um, and that's not a sufficient reason um, in, um, from an ethical point of view. We as physicians have other duties um, besides recognizing the autonomy of patients. Uh, we all went into medical school because we said we wanted to help people. Um, we want to care for them. Uh, we want to not harm them. We want to do so in a way that cherishes each of us um, as a patient, as a human being, um, and fits into uh, an entire society, a common good, where we all belong equally. Assisted suicide is also a bad ethics because it violates the fundamental respect for the dignity of every human being that ought to undergird um, our medicine. Because if you think about it, to do assisted suicide necessitates my endorsement or society's endorsement or the state's endorsement of the premise that a particular life is not worth living. That's just logical, right? If somebody says I'm better off dead, it means they think that their life is no longer worth living. Once we have decided that dependence upon other uh, people um, is a sufficient reason to say your life is not worth living, um, incontinence, um, um, being a burden on others, then in fact, we have assaulted the idea that all lives um, are valuable um, and that the loss of every person through death is a loss. It's a loss for their families, it's a loss for society, and we ought to mourn the death of every, uh, every person and not cause it. And I think this is the heart of the resistance um, by the disabled community. It's not that they are going to be lined up in their wheelchairs um, and um, forcibly injected, although you know that day might come. Um, I think it is the very idea that your life is no longer worth living um, if you say um, that your dependence upon others makes it um, not worth living. That's an assault and an affront to the dignity of every person who needs to depend upon others every single day of their lives. And it's a terrible indictment of our society to think that we would endorse the idea that when other people need us, they are burdens. In fact, assisted suicide flips the default switch. Um, people, once this is a, a made legal, patients need to justify why they are staying alive. 
the question arises immediately, um, as it does for the insurance companies, as Dr. Callister pointed out, uh, why haven't you asked for your prescription yet? Um, this is what Dr. Callister was suggesting becomes the duty to die. Once this is possible, don't all of us then have a duty to not be burdens on other people um, and, um, um, and, um, and ask for this kind of assistance? Um, I think assisted suicide is also bad ethics because it's dishonest. We are not using in this panel the term medical aid in dying because it is disingenuously ambiguous. Palliative care is aid in dying. I aid lots of patients in dying, helping to make their days as good as they can um, until nature takes them away from us. Um, the Maryland law would also, again, as Dr. Callister pointed out, force doctors to falsify death certificates. The cause of death, according to the, um, the bill, is to be the underlying condition. So you mean to tell me that if I um, give a patient um, a prescription for a lethal dose of a medicine and they take it, that the cause of death is not that prescription, but the underlying uh, disease they might have had? That's simply a lie. And you're asking physicians to lie um, on death certificates. What are people hiding? You ought to be asking yourself that. Assisted suicide is also bad law. Um, you've heard a little bit about abuse, um, but there are slippery slopes, one of which is a logical uh, one, which is that whatever justifies um, assisted suicide logically also justifies euthanasia. So when somebody tells you, we're not after euthanasia, we're only after assisted suicide, the reasons they give um, that um, uh, it's justified on the basis of autonomy or um, mercy for patients um, means that um, the very same reasons can be given um, to justify um, uh, a euthanasia. Um, and in fact, um, under um, a, a, a logic of trying to treat patients equally, um, what happens if someone um, comes to us and says, well, that other patient um, isn't paralyzed and they can take the pills. So what are my, if they have the right to kill themselves, why don't I have the right to kill myself? Um, and that would imply um, that the law would need, in fact, um, to allow people to move from assisted suicide uh, to euthanasia. Um, and there are already um, um, a certainly bills um, afoot um, in some states in the United States to expand euthan um, from assisted suicide to, suicide to euthanasia in that direction. Also under law, um, equal protection would say uh, that we would move from voluntary assisted suicide uh, to um, voluntary active euthanasia, as I just suggested, uh, but also then to non-voluntary euthanasia. Um, after all, um, um, if people have, uh, are granted the legal right to be able to end their lives. Um, and why do we um, say that they have to be um, uh, able to say that themselves? Um, certainly someone who is um, uh, demented might have their family provide what they call a substituted judgment and say that grandma would have wanted this if she were able to speak to us. And therefore you move not from, uh, from one of the quote unquote safeguards of saying the patient um, actually has to do it to a mandate uh, that the patient um, um, can be thought to ask for it because we construe them as being someone who would have wanted it. Um, these kinds of logical forces just move in this direction. Um, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Canada, Patients who are demented, again, one of the safeguards, oh, no, no, it's only for people who are of right mind. Well, that's not what happens in the rest of the world. Um, infants um, in, uh, are euthanized um, in the Netherlands and Belgium. Mentally ill patients can now be euthanized in Canada. And there are expansion bills in these directions um, afoot um, um, throughout the United States. There's also a psychological um, slippery slope. Um, one of the most chilling films I think I've ever seen in my life was a, a Dutch uh, euthanist um, who was asked, <clears throat> um, was it difficult uh, 
to do this, for you to, to be able to engage in this, um, injecting patients. And he said, well, it was hard the first time. It's sad to say that, um, uh, but a, true, a, a truth about human nature that what we do, we tend to repeat and we tend to justify. Um, so once we have moved in the direction of doing this, it becomes much easier to expand the indications and to keep doing this for more people. Further, it is hard work to care for a patient um, who is um, disabled. It's hard work to care for a patient who has um, a terminal condition. Um, it is very easy for us to say, I wouldn't want to live like this, to indicate this in very subtle ways um, maybe not directly, but through our body language, um, indirect speech um, to patients so that what's called counter-transference occurs. So that the patient thinks it's actually their idea when it becomes ours in the first place. Here, I think, is what we all want. This is Sir Luke Fildes's uh, a portrait of a dying child um, called the doctor, um, where a child is surrounded by people um, who love her, who care for her. Um, Martin Luther King used to say, keep your eye on the prize. The prize for us is the patient. Every patient, if we have a healthy, legitimate system of health care, um, has to be prized um, as a unique individual um, for whom we care, um, for whom we make the best of their uh, lives for as much time as they have, um, not um, extending it any longer um, than it needs to be, um, but certainly not hastening it and endorsing uh, the premise um, that the world is better off without anybody. Um, the world is always um, in mourning whenever we lose any one of us. Um, we should always regret that. We should not precipitate death. Uh, we should not make it legal. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dr. Salmezi. Uh, Senator Hoffman, you're up now. I cannot open up my video. Cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. I suppose the, I was always told I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a, I had a face for a radio, Deborah. So um, do you want to try to, See if you can turn the. Kayleen, can you try to turn, uh, sort of redo the settings so that Senator Hoffman can start his video? <laughs> yep, sorry, one moment. Start my video. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Hoffman. Behind me is the Minnesota State Capitol. Of course, it is uh, it's still snowy out and, and it's still coming. Um, happy to be here. And uh, thank you to the 246 participants uh, on this call and, and uh, video stream, and as well as uh, the folks, Dr. Callister, John Kelly, uh, Anita Cameron, Dr. Somalsay, uh, um, some I'll say, sorry, I'm just like, I can't pronounce, but I'm good for, for sharing some pretty lived experience um, examples of what we're talking about here. When you're talking about a bioethics conversation or bioethics question, right? To me, that's a systems conversation, right? Not necessarily an individualistic conversation, although we're talking about individual persons, right? But if we're going to make a decision based on individual persons, we're not looking at the full system. And I noticed some of the comments in the chat and some of the comments it's very much um, individualized, not the systems. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the legislative system uh, that's involved in this conversation. And we're going to go back to 1963, Minnesota uh, banned uh, suicide, assisted suicide in 1963, it was upheld in 1992 where they really strengthen that with the words assist and advise uh, or encouraged is actually prohibited in the language. And then as we know, there are two or three court cases that were that have challenged within Minnesota statute, Minnesota law um, to have that discussion. In 2014, um, I was on the 
housing and, and health and human services and housing policy committee um, 2014 when a bill was brought in in front of us um, and it was not once but twice and at the time I had said why are you creating a brand new chapter in Minnesota state statute and and then the question was well because we want to and I said well you know it makes sense if you're going to have a discussion about healthcare agents or healthcare or discussions to stay within the chapter that's germane to that jurisdiction. And in this case, um, why aren't you having the discussion in the chapter of Minnesota statute that's specific to the authority of making particular healthcare decisions, right? Um, that was a question that was thrown out there. That question was um, never addressed. Uh, and, and as they proceeded forward with the conversation, creating a brand new chapter, and I'm going to tell you why logistically, when you're in legislation, you're going to create a brand new chapter. It's not just isolated into that one chapter that you're talking about, but rather there's other rules, regulations, and I'll go down that avenue. If I have more than 20 minutes to explain this, I absolutely will take advantage of that. Um, but that's supposed to be funny, doctor, but it's not. So I won't try to be funny because my wife told me I'm not funny. But if you're going to stay in that chapter, you, you create a new chapter. There are all these isolated and insulated chapters of law that come into place, right? And for example, if we create a brand new chapter, then all of a sudden we're going to go into rules. And chapter, chapter rule 4685 is really garnishing the health maintenance organizations, the HMOs. And there's a due process question that exists within the current language that's out there. If you look at this bill, or if you look at um, the bill that was produced in 2014 and again in 2019, due process was an issue that was floated up. Uh, assurances are an issue that are floated up, as well as informed choice. People want to get into a discussion about informed choice, you know, so be it, because then you have to have informed choice, informed consent, you have to have those conversations, which by the way, folks, a lot of them have some statutory language tied to it, correct? And so when you're saying you're gonna change something, number one, what am I doing to look at the assurances so that there are no unintended consequences at the end of the day? At the beginning of the day, it might be because this was something that happened to an individual I know, or I happen to be that person with the lived experience that is going through this, therefore I want it to happen for me. Perfect. But I'm not talking about you, and I'm not talking about that individual, other individual. What I'm talking about is the other individuals that it could happen at the end of the day that we didn't, as a legislative body, have a discussion on regarding assurances, due process, and informed choice. And so when you look at creating a brand new chapter, then you got to look over into the rules section within that chapter. And some of those rules that are there also then bid back into, all right, I have a complaint or I have a problem with this. So now in Minnesota statute, I have to go back to a complaint system, which is embedded into Minnesota state chapter 62D.11. If you want to look at all those, you can. Nowhere in this current language does anything ever refer back to how those systems are going to be impacted within statutory language. So what does that leave at the end of the day? Interpretation problems. Interpretation problems that don't have any pinpoint examples of where you're going with what you're trying to do. And I'm hoping I'm making sense because a lot of times we might have something that's good. And, and I'll give you a, a visual example. In the Health and Human Services Reform Committee that I serve as lead in right now, um, we are trying to align up the DWRS system in the state of Minnesota. It's a dis disability rate waiver service system, right? It's under Centers for Medicaid Services. And, and imagine going into your kitchen, you don't open up all your cupboards and you see where you have all your, your cans lined up, beans over here, potatoes over here, wherever. But so many times, Minnesota law and any other state laws, when they define new statute, they don't look at it from the perspective of, oh, should I organize my cabinets first so that everything makes sense? I'm gonna put the green beans over here, the yellow beans over here, brown beans here. No, what they do is they come up with a brand new set of beans and they decide to put it someplace within there. And here's a prime example, this new statute that wants to be developed by this new bill or this new old bill from 2014, 2019 and, and now creates a brand new section in Minnesota state statute under 145. 
And 145, it sits under the Uniform Duties to Disabled Persons Act. That's where 145, 862 is go. This is going to be in the 870 range, right? So it's going to create a brand new carve out section in there that's way before special diets and before the Maternal Child Health Bureau statutes lay. So now you're going to put this in here with no references regarding to the two other chapters I just threw at you, plus some of the rules that have to be in place, right? So there's a logical illogic to why you're going to try to present this bill without having to work on from a baseline. So from a legislative perspective, this bill is, you know, no offense, it's dead on arrival because of the fact it doesn't line those up in the sense of how the system should be. And why is that important, folks, right? If I don't address the three things I talked about, assurance, due process, and informed choice, from the viewpoint of Let's pick on the HMOs, health maintenance organizations, right? We know the HMOs that are established under rule, right? Chapter 4685.0100 definitions of what an HMO is. They're also embedded in state statute. That's when you get into the 62s, right? 62D something. Um, who governs the HMOs and their decision when it comes to the drug formulary, all right? That's not even addressed in this whole thing. But the authorization of the HMOs and the drug formulary also fall under the sections that are there, a whole different section within Minnesota state statute. Those fall under 256B. So are you guys tracking with me about the illogical response to how this, oh, let's come up with this brand new bill. Let's put it out here. No, you're gonna force years of legislators trying to align other things up or you're going to force the reviser and within the departments aligning everything up that was never lined up from the get-go. This bill is not ready for prime time because nobody's thinking about how this is going to approach the systems from a legislative viewpoint. And when I get into the sub -depart subdivision 13 of 256B, which specifically deals with drugs, right? That delineation of that statute goes to another statute in Minnesota that this bill is not addressing, which is in the 145A.02s, which is the purposes of those uh, disease controlled or controlled drugs, right? There's, a, there's an alignment all within those that happen. And then there's a dispensary conversation, which, you know, is all within there. But for the purposes, let me just say to this, for the purposes of this, it's absolutely some things that come into play in this statute. And one of them is that the commissioner um, must make the decisions that if there's a, a drug that is not a therapeutic option for a patient, there's a whole different conversation in there. So now you wanna define therapeutic option for a patient? Oh, by the way, that's another statutory definition that needs to be addressed as well. So what I'm trying to tell you guys, it's not just having a process conversation, which we can go back to. And Dr. Callister, I've, I've, I've seen some of your work and there's a you did a, a little outline of seven misconceptions or seven givings or the seven points um, that people should actually go back and read upon, which you addressed a couple of them on here as well. But the other thing I think that is missing out that legislators do really take into effect, not discussion of drug formulary committee or not discussion of where embedded in statute this thing is actually going to rest other than creating its own new statutory definition, which absolutely makes no sense. But being normal is best seems to be an ableistic term that's running out there. Yes, legislators understand what ableism is. And so when we're sitting there looking at the, the whole piece about does ableism exist within medical definition, it sure does. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Somalsi just actually kind of laid some of that out for us to look at. So for example, ableist underpinnings is the idea that, 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 that everything that is normal is best, right? So what does that mean for me? So then what that says is there's an undermined ability within the clinics to engage with patients with disabilities um, as they, in fact, in their lives, there's a distortion of communication regarding transitions, experiences, and various states that occur to people, right, uh, that are having a disability because of the person that's perceiving that ableism to them or their bias that's to them. That's a process issue, right? I'm not here to talk about the process issue, but I'm going to tell you this. 
believe me, there's a lot of legislators who are thinking in the back of their mind, how is this going to deal with or address certain segments of the population? And I don't know, let's say, for example, those in home and community based services under 245 D that some of them are wards of the state. Some of them are not wards of the state. Some of them are wards of counties and yet none of them are some are not within the wards of counties. Who then determines that? Well, counties then give that ward definition to third party programs or vendors. And in some cases, these are private or nonprofit vendors that are there acting on behalf of the individual. Whoa, now you're dripping down a whole new set of chapters of law, right? Um, folks, that, that just to me, legislatively, you don't put a bill out on the table to do a shock and awe and then make a decision without having the conversations I just threw out at you that are gonna need to happen because although it might look good at the front saying, it's my right, I dang it, I'm, I need to have this right. Absolutely, God bless that right for you, but I am so sorry. We're not talking about you as the individual. What we're talking about is those individuals that at the forefront of the day, if we as society are not thinking about those individuals, then what Hubert Humphrey says, we've done not our due diligence and we've not done what we should be doing because ultimately society is judged upon how we work with individuals with disabilities, how we work with those who are most vulnerable, how we work for those that are at the dawning of life, right? And, and those of no Hubert Humphrey from Waverly, Minnesota is there. So let me pull it back. When you look at Senate file, and I think it's 1352, House file, I don't even know what the number is. Um, um, the Senate file 1352, when you look at people that live with disabilities, people that are poor, people that are vulnerable, there aren't enough appropriate safeguards in place to assure. And if you want to get into the discussion of the guardianship issue, um, what about those youth? What about those youth that are transitioning from childhood into adulthood and the guardianship issue within then there? Absolutely. Even if it affects one person, folks, it's a systems conversation that you have to have. You must have that conversation and it's not happening right now. Giving non-physicians the, the ability to prescribe, hmm, um, there's another uh, implication within statute that does that, right? By saying, using language in here, they use the word may multiple times, right? That's permissive. Um, any lawyers in this room will tell you that's non-permissive or permissive language is open and fraught for lots of different reasons that are not very viable to the existence of, of an argument, right? And in this case, when you say, you know, you're not going to require somebody to have a mental health evaluation, well, whose decision is that? Or even if that is in place, they may, I think in this terms, they may refer, a doctor may refer that person to a mental health professional if there's an if clause in there. May and if clauses uh, are really debatable clauses. When you look at the healthcare profession as a whole then, and you're saying, well, we believe that there's a do no harm clause in there. What does that mean, do no harm? Who's gonna define what that means or how is that defined? You know, that's still a question that lays up there. That's a question that this panel is, is dealing with there, right? And the other thing that comes into play is when you start to say that um, must be or may not be present, um, if the person does it individually, there's some other assurance safeguards within that that then get into the question I had, the three things I talked about, assurances, due process, and informed choice side. You've got to have that conversation in there. And so as I, as I end the conversation, I, I just want you to, to be aware of, you know, ableism is real. And whether you guys have talked about it or not, I'm going to tell you, um, it is real. And um, and believe me, there's a, a, enough legislators that are going to sit there. And, and, and I'll take you back to one thing. You need 34 votes in the Senate to pass something uh, in Minnesota, right? Uh, you need 34 people to say yes to something to pass something in the Senate. In the House, you need 67. And you also look at the fact that um, some, a lot of times in the Senate bill, you're going to need some bipartisan support in here. Unfortunately, um, the author of this bill, there's no bipartisan support in this bill, period. So guess what? That means you have 31 people in the Senate that
that perhaps would sign on to this bill. You can't, you can only get five, but the five are partisan people. So the first thing you look at is say, what are the chances of this thing um, that is gonna go to uh, the house? Well, well, it's not gonna pass the Senate, right? Based upon that logis logistical, strategical, political look at it, it's not gonna go anywhere in the Senate. In the house, it might, but in the house you can put, you need 67 people to pass something in the House. You can have up to 25 authors on a bill. In this case, I think the House bill has maybe 15 authors on it. So it doesn't mean anything other than 15 people signed on to it. But if you're strategically looking at how am I going to get to 67, I got to go from 25 to 67 is a less of a hurdle than 15 to 67. But yet at the same time, I also got to get some movement um, in hearings within there. And I just don't see that happening due to the fact there's enough people I know in the House that are raising the same issues I've raised on assurances, due process, and informed choice. So, and, and, and again, and I, I highlighted those in, in the construct of those other statutes that are in place here that you need to look at. So I'm here today just to really pose a question on a wider lens, right? And when you look at, at this situation that an individual may have or may have, there's a disability, Anything that could cloud or make that decision, um, you know, who makes the decision? It's a question. It's the same thing. I got ripped because I asked the question regarding um, um, vaccines and, and ventilators in a hospital. And it wasn't a point or counterpoint issue, but rather it was who's making that ultimate decision to take that vent off an individual, right? Well, then I got into the discussion of process and you know, there's an ethical committee and there's all this stuff but they never answered the question who ultimately made that decision or makes that decision, right? And so that thing was put out there just to get that question on the table. In the same sense here, I'm throwing it out on the table saying, you guys didn't think about this bill in depth. All you did is grab, some, somebody plucked it some, someplace and threw it at the, at the state of Minnesota. Well, I'm sorry, the other some places, there's a lot of us in the state of Minnesota that actually understand how legislation works and actually understand how laws should intertwine with one another. And unfortunately, this one doesn't do it. And I know I'm running out of time, but I just want to get to this. Um, I've spent my entire life representing uh, voices of people uh, in, in the case that matter. And I hold on, you know, that all lives matter. And, and, and we must make our decisions based upon that piece about that all lives do matter, right? And that includes everyone. So if you're making a, a decision based upon a few people and not for everybody, then I suggest you come back and, and answer that question on well, who ultimately is going to make those decisions. And so um, I, I thank you for your time here. And I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to give you a little perspective on when you have a bill and it's presented, you're going to run into a whole bunch of different avenues or lanes that you need to be aware of and, and able to go down because those questions will pop. And so with that, I, I, I thank you folks for engaging in this conversation and um, honor to be here. Thanks for joining us. So um, that's it for the um, presentations and we'll move now into the discussion period. And uh, for those of you speakers who um, are uh, able or willing, um, you know, turn on your video and, and join us. And if not, then certainly we understand that and not. Um, I want to start with a concern that got raised and actually in the chat um, about what may have been uh, a misunderstanding about um, uh, Canadian law around physician assisted suicide or medical aid and dying. Um, the, the terms themselves are very meaningful and very loaded. Uh, uh, a concern, uh, uh, you know, uh, someone wanted to clarify that under Canadian law, um, uh, minors uh, would not qualify and uh, mentally ill, uh, so just psychiatric conditions themselves would not qualify someone. I don't know if anyone wanted to speak to that. There's been some discussion about Canadian law here today.
No. Okay, then. So having clarified that, let's move to the Q and A. Yeah. Can I just, Deborah? Can I just say one thing? Absolutely. Um, I did notice uh, uh, the questions. People re said mentally ill patient or mentally ill person. Can we, you know, when I see that, I, I think to my point about ableism or to my point about you're not normal, so you're not actually, you know, you know, well, normal. The last time I looked, Deborah was on the cycle cycle on a washing machine. And so, yeah. you know, uh, you know, I happen to be a person who lives with X. I happen to be a person who has this, right? I'm not a per, you know, I'm a person first. So I just, I noticed that. And that was in the context of that question. And I just wanted to raise that from my viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is Anita. Yes. Um, from what I understand of the Canadian law, there's a, a study period or something for 18 months regarding um, people with psychiatric disabilities as far as um, uh, them being able, um, you know, them being able to uh, access assisted suicide. Um, it's not that it's out, it, 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 they're studying it. Yes. So it's not like it's not in the law. Um, they are looking at it, so thanks. Okay, let's move to the first question then, which is um, about uh, voluntarily stopping um, eating and drinking, uh, which uh, uh, is um, uh, allowable now. Uh, the, um, and we have actually a couple of questioners who wonder if speakers on the panel would also oppose voluntary stopping uh, of eating and drinking. And if not, what the moral difference is between that and medical aid and dying or physician assisted suicide or um, uh, however you wanna um, sort of characterize the bill that's under consideration. Dr. Slamazy. Yeah, I can, uh, can start on that. I consider voluntarily stopping eating and drinking to be a form um, of assisted suicide. Um, um, and if a physician is involved in it, then it is physician assisted suicide. Um, there is a difference um, between patients who have lost the ability to eat um, due to a physiologic condition, um, patients at the end stages of Alzheimer's disease who can no longer swallow, for instance, or neurologic disease, um, um, or just cancer where people naturally lose their appetites. No one's talking about um, them in this category. Um, they don't have to have any um, uh, uh, people naturally at the end of almost every disease lose the ability to eat, right? What's being talked about in voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is someone um, who um, uh, doesn't even necessarily have a terminal um, condition, um, certainly has the ability to eat and makes the choice not to eat. Um, and the reason they choose not to eat is in order to make themselves dead. Um, and if that's what you're doing, then it's a form of suicide. Um, and almost no one, and Tim Quill, a very big proponent of assisted suicide always says this, almost no one is actually able to do that um, without, some, without the help of a physician because it is just so hard to be able to not eat. <laughs> this is what we're naturally tending to do. So people then typically ask for drugs or something else to help them ease their way um, through this, um, or it is suggested by a physician. Um, and in both cases, then the physician would be involved. So then by definition, it is a form of physician assisted suicide. So Dr. Salmezi, there is a, a follow-up question um, here from one of our attendees who wants to know if it would follow that hospice should refuse to um, take care um, of patients who opt for voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. That's a, a you know obviously a complicated question. It depends yeah. on the uh, on the case, um, um, and this is these are the kinds of ambiguities that sometimes people trade upon in order to sort of satisfy uh, you know saying that things are legal, right? Um, so if someone was um, 18 years old, um, healthy, and said, um, "I don't want to eat, and I want to." Um, I want hospice to take care of me. Um, I think there's no hospice in the world that would say that this is something that they would participate in. They're um, helping someone um, to commit suicide. 
Um, on the other hand, hospices always um, um, help people who um, uh, have um, reached the terminal stages of a disease and uh, typically stop um, uh, hydrating them uh, or wouldn't put an IV in them at the end of life. Um, the, the wisdom of the hospice nurses I know is that it's better to die dry than to die wet, right? If someone is actually at the end stages of a disease, then it can be more burdensome to them to actually give them um, extra um, um, hydration, for instance, with an IV because it makes breathing more difficult, it can make them swell in ways that are uncomfortable. Um, so um, uh, where it probably uh, comes in um, uh, would be the person who has, let's say, very early Alzheimer's disease um, and says, um, I anticipate that my life is going to be one of suffering and dependence, and so I want to stop eating now. Um, and, um, and I think that um, if they're not in the terminal stages of a disease, they actually wouldn't be eligible for hospice. And, um, uh, and if they are at the end stages of a disease, then they don't have the capacity um, actually to make that as, a, uh, as a, uh, an autonomous judgment. So in neither case would they be eligible um, for, um, for that under hospice. Uh, uh, Dr. Callister, did you want to add to that? And then I see Senator Hoffman has his hand up. Sure. I, I would just focus on something Dr. Solmacy just touched on. I think it's critically important to separate, and that's why I emphasize it, receiving a terminal diagnosis versus actively dying. So you can have a terminal diagnosis for a long, long time. At the very, very end, when you are actively dying, most people stop drinking and eating. And at that point of the dying process, that is now a natural part of dying. That's very different than someone who's not actively dying, suddenly going without uh, food or water. So, so you have to separate those two. And that's why as Dr. Solmacy, I think rightly pointed out, it depends on the individual situation. Uh, you know, when you have two days to go and you're semi comatose with a actively dying from a terminal disease that's at the very, very end, again, not eating, not drinking at that point is a natural part of dying. And in fact, giving them forced fluids or nutrition when they're actively dying it is not a natural death at all. It would actually fall in the category of artificially prolonging life in comparison to someone who may be disabled or vegetative or otherwise who's not actively dying. And that I think you have to really separate when you consider that situation that can't be lumped into the same group. Senator Hoffman. Dr. DeBruin, thank you. Um, Minnesota statute 145C.02 called healthcare directive. And if you look at the rules promulgated by that, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health actually has listed in there um, what your healthcare directive could be, and somebody could look it up. And one of them is about hydration. Um, let me get it. Instructions about artificial nutrition and hydration. That individual can make a healthcare directive ahead of time in this, to Dr. Right. Callister's point. And so, um, you know, coming back to the whole piece, I mean, you know, that is laid out as statutory um, issues as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, but I, I just want to acknowledge here that there are a lot of questions in the Q&A function, and I don't think we're going to get to all of them by the time we're done today. So I'm, I'm, I, I won't cover them all, and my apologies to folks if your question doesn't get addressed, but I'm going to try to highlight a few more here in the time we have left. Uh, so we have a question actually from one of the speakers uh, from the last event, um, who is uh, 25 years old and has terminal cancer um, and who um, essentially wants to know um, uh, why she ought not to have the autonomous right um, to decide that uh, she should um, be able to end her life when she wants to end her life through um, a law like the one under consideration. So, so essentially to her, it is about autonomy. And, and, uh, and I know that th this is sort of, um, a, there's a broader framing that you all are trying to, uh, um, trying to get people to think about. And I'm one, but I'm wondering how you would respond directly to her. Again, it's very, um, it's very difficult to do so um, outside of a particular context, knowing the individual, 
um, uh, you know, and trying to, um, uh, certainly the kind of lecture I just gave um, is not what I would talk, say to one of my patients, right? Um, who right. asks, right? So, um, so there are, um, um, you know, questions to be, uh, um, uh, to be asked that way. But obviously the whole point of, uh, of our talk today um, is to sort of say that, um, you know, um, um, in many ways that are, it's not just about autonomy. I think the Senator was um, very um, articulate about saying that we are not atoms, right? We are connected um, um, to each other. And so someone suggesting they have a right to do something doesn't mean that it actually is something that a society um, ought, to, um, uh, ought to permit. Um, and we have to recognize that there are ramifications for what we want um, that um, affect other people um, and that therefore that's part of what law does because it doesn't just protect individuals, it protects an, um, not an entire um, society. Um, with individuals, when they talk to me or to Dr. Uh, Callister about this, it's a very different um, uh, set of questions. So I would start by saying, you know, what are you afraid of, right? Um, what are you, um, what, what really is leading you to do this? Um, is it pain, the possibility of pain? Well, here's the plan we can offer you that you don't need assisted suicide for. We can treat your pain. Is it nausea? I can treat the nausea. Um, is it being a burden on others? Oh, I hope you don't think that you're a burden on others. Certainly you're not a burden on me. I'm your doctor. I'm here to help you, right? Those are the kinds of conversations we need to have with individuals who ask these questions. Um, and that's a very different setting from the, the sort of lecture, which is largely to do with public policy and ethics. You, you are absolutely right about the different settings for sure. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly, you have your hand up and then Dr. Kalster. Sure, uh, I sympathize with the person. My heart goes out to her, but as Dr. Salmezi said, the impact on other people uh, leads to uh, a lack of justice. Uh, we are not just autonomous beings. We belong to other people. Uh, these, these bills are framed as individual uh, decisions which don't relate to other people, but we know that many people will be involved in the chance of persuasion, coercion, and abuse is impossible to uh, prevent. And I would just like to say that with palliative care, that you, the patient actually has increased autonomy. I visited a friend who was dying and I wanted to bring her a storyboard because she was a disability rights activist. And when I came over, she uh, took less of her pain medicine so that she could be fully or more cogent with me. And then when I left, she increased her drugs again. So uh, people can manage their own levels of consciousness and pain relief. Uh, palliative care empowers people. Dr. Kalsher? Yeah, I think it's so important to recognize the sadness that anyone, and I feel, I feel from my heart for this patient that that's an awful thing to be going through, especially at such a young age. And to what Dr. Solmacy alluded to, you know, in any individual case, what are the symptoms, but beyond symptoms that you have, what are you afraid of? How can we sit down and address those things together? As far as getting to the very end, uh, John Kelly, he's absolutely right. We need to put our efforts and education and funding into better and more widespread palliative care education and training for all physicians and nurses and anyone else that will be accompanying folks on their terminal course. You know, I was once asked the question at the end of life, the very end again, um, somebody said, well, Dr. Collister, uh, what about morphine for respiratory distress at the end? And, you know, you give 10 milligrams of morphine to someone for respiratory distress, which is a known and accepted treatment, and their breathing slows, and maybe they die an hour or two before they would have died. 
what's the difference between that and what we're talking about today? And my answer was simple. It's called intent. My intent was to treat that respiratory symptom. My intent was not to purposely draw up an intentional overdose designed to actively kill you. And there lies all the difference at, as far as those terminal courses. So thank you. Um, I want to invite you all to um, speak to a question that got raised last time that at last time I promised I would raise again today. Um, and uh, that is if people uh, oppose this bill, last time I asked the question uh, because it was raised in the Q&A, what should we do if we support this bill? Um, uh, what should people do if they oppose this bill? Senator Hoffman, should we start with you, sir? How much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's when you look at the bill, there's 21 subdivisions in the in the bill, how they lay it out. And 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 there are, you know, somebody had made a comment about there's assurances. No, there's no assurances in there. I'm sorry, but there are actually no no the assurances that that I and a lot of people are looking at are are not in this bill. It's so badly written, folks. Um, and so the, the thing is, so the question is, yes, I've read the bill. And so um, multiple times, what you need to be able to do is create a relationship with your current elected official. Don't care where you live. Don't care who that person is. Don't care if they're a Republican or Democrat or independent. It doesn't matter. Jim Ramstead, who was a congressman for Minnesota for many years, taught me years ago, look, when it comes to health and human services and education, leave your ego in the hallway. It should be pragmatic and common sense. So if you believe who you what you want to get across, a phone call, email, a handwritten note to your, your local legislator, not just saying what you believe and what you want to do. You're a constituent. Here's the problem. This is what you see as has the you know the answer and then offer yourself up as a has a has a service kathy joe ware is on this call i know i saw her name and i'm going to tell you she is an absolute advocate for kids with disabilities and has become an actual resource to me she doesn't live in my my community but is a huge resource to me when it comes to provisions of nursing and kids with disabilities ieps county case management stuff right so you want to be able to create a relationship with your elected official that has that Invite them out for coffee or, or have a Zoom meeting with them. There's no reason why they couldn't do that. Educate them about why it's important that something like this actually doesn't um, uh, pass. Regardless of where you see they're at, you're a constituent, your voice matters, and you should be heard. Does that make sense, Doc? It does, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Callister, I'm going to let you have the last word here. Uh, we're just about out of time. Yeah, uh, real briefly, um, the individual suggestions the senator just put forth are excellent. And I would encourage you to, to do exactly that. If you're inclined to maybe be part of a group that works to fight these laws, there's a couple, there's a national group, a nonprofit called the Patient Rights Action Fund that's quite well organized. And then there's a group there in Minnesota, I think it's called the Minnesota Alliance for Ethical Healthcare. Uh, their website's ethicalcaremn.org. And I know that's something within the, just the state of Minnesota might be a resource for you to explore at least. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, I, I wanna thank you all for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts. Um, I'd, as I said at the outset, it is um, really um, uh, important, I think, for us to hear from multiple perspectives. And we did that today. We did that at the last um, event as well. Uh, and um, I am really grateful that you uh, all came and shared your perspectives with everyone here. Um, so thank you again for taking the time to be with us. Uh, last thing I'll say today is that I hope uh, that attendees will join us for our next Ethics Grand Rounds, which is scheduled for March 4th. Uh, from 12.15 to 1.30. Dr. Jennifer Pra from the University of Pennsylvania is going to be joining us to talk about identifying and addressing gaps in health outcomes using the health capability profile. She's going to talk to us about um, some research uh, uh, about uh, chronic hepatitis in rural Senegal and how that um, public health ethics uh, framework sort of applies to that sort of work. It should be fascinating. Um, and I hope you all join us then. 
Thanks very much again for being with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.